Good morning, YouTube pipe smokers. Today's a good day to talk about air conditioning, especially in your car. It'll be hot the next few days. But the summer's here anyway, but so. First, I'll say the disclaimer, there are exceptions to everything. So, but this is in most cases we're talking about. <clears throat> so let's say you have a 20 year old car, which is not that uncommon, and not that, uh, that old, so 2000 car, 2001, you know, 18 years, 19 years old, and you turn on the AC, and it's not blowing cold air. Generally speaking, you have a leak in the system because a sealed AC system should never leak and never run low. It's not a... AC doesn't consume over time Freon. Like motor oil, if you don't put motor oil, your engine burns a little bit of it, eventually you run out of motor oil. Uh, Freon doesn't work like that. So, as soon as you have cold air or not as cold air, generally speaking, assuming all the components in the system are working, you have a leak. Now, There's many areas to leak, hoses, and where hoses meet components, there's O-rings. Over time, between the heat and cold weather, they can expand and contract, and you can develop a leak there. You could develop a leak at the compressor. So first, let's talk about the components of the AC. You have a compressor, a condenser, that's in front of the radiator hoses, an evaporator that's in the car, that's usually behind the dash, and um, you have what they call a receiver dryer that traps, uh, it's actually it acts as a filter in some regards, um, and that's it. So any of those components can fail or leak and cause you to not have AC. Now there is AC sealer on the market. It comes with uh, Freon, you, everybody's seen them and they're in the cans with the gauge. The can's a little expensive, $25. The sealer doesn't always work. And you run the risk of ruining your system trying to use a sealer. Not all the time, but it can happen. Now I'll give you an example. I have a 2004 Dodge. I have a leak in the evaporator, which is behind the dash. It's a big job. You got to pull out the whole dashboard to get to it. The leak started small, so every year I'd have to add a few ounces of Freon, and I'd be good for the summer. The leak finally started getting bigger and bigger. I didn't have the time to do it, and I can't be without AC, so I tried the sealer, and it's been two years, and it's, it's still holding up, and the system works, and it blows cold. So the product does work, but not always. It's a last-ditch effort. So if you have a small leak, you can use those cans in the store, as I said, to top it off yourself. It's safe. The end only fits on the low pressure side, so you can't really hurt yourself. It has the built-in gauge. Now this is only for R134. The newer cars have a new Freon that requires much more sophisticated equipment. Um, a lot of shops don't even have it yet. And that's called, the, that's the new 410A, I think is the, the designation. So, 
just to recap, if you have a small leak, you can add some free on yourself and probably get through the summer. Now here's the other big problem with AC work. So now let's say you have an older car, the compressor goes bad, which is not that uncommon. So now you change this 20 year old compressor, you put a new compressor on, and if you're not lucky, now you start to have other problems because now the new compressor, compressor is pumping out pressure like it when it was new on a system that's 20 years old. So any weak link in that system, hoses, seals, evaporator, condenser, now may start to fail or leak. So I try to be very cautious in my shop when I do AC work because I tell the people, because it appears if you don't explain what's going on, then people think you're ripping them off. So a car comes in with no AC, I put an AC compressor on, if that's what's bad. Fill it up, we charge it, we put the dye in it, we check for leaks visually, immediately. They take the car home, a week later they come back saying this it's blowing warm again. Check it out, we find a leak, let's say a hose, so now it needs a hose. We do that hose, another week goes by and now it's warm again. And this can happen several times. And now the customer's getting frustrated because they're going back and forth. They think you don't know what you're doing because every week you're adding another part to the AC component. And then if you're really not lucky, the evaporator inside the car goes bad. So now you have a customer that spent hundreds to a, a thousands of dollars with you, and now you gotta tell them it needs an evaporator. Because we sealed up all the leaks and restored the compressor to like new condition, and now all the other 20-year-old components are failing. And people have a hard time accepting this. But that's reality. And you want to just pull out your dash to put an evaporator. It's not an easy job. And you're not going to change every component. So you have to do it on a as-it-fails basis. But it can get tedious and frustrating for both the shop and the customer. So that's the thing on AC stuff. So now, while we're talking about car stuff, another important uh, subject is those cigarette lighter adapters that everybody uses to charge their phone. Be careful. Every place sells them. Gas stations, Home Depot. Everywhere you go, you see buckets on the counter full of them. The cheaper ones, which is usually the ones in the gas station, can cause trouble. They interfere with the car's electronics. We had a Subaru that uh, it had one of these adapters plugged in and it would not shift. Transmission stopped shifting. Anyway, long story short, using scan tools and diagnostic, we know about external power sources, so we unplugged everything from the car that was added. And as soon as we unplugged that cigarette lighter adapter, it cured the problem. So it's another thing to be mindful of. Also, a lot of insurance companies now have that 
I call it DS, that discount program if you plug something into your OBD2. So it tracks your speed and uh, it tracks everything, your location. Those can cause a problem sometimes. So if you have any weird problems that just pop up, before you take it to a mechanic, unplug all your accessories that you added. If you have one of those OBD, a lot of gadgets now plug into the OBD2 for heads-up display, for um, uh, engine you know, diagnostics, uh, the insurance companies have them, cigarette lighters, everybody's plugging more and more stuff into their cigarette lighter. We call in some cars, there's like four or five USB ports plugged into the cigarette lighter. That can cause a problem. It's a red flag. Unplug all that stuff and see if it solves your problem. Also, headlights and taillights. A lot of times, you're better off going to the manufacturer for that taillight or headlight. Because if you put dissimilar bulbs, it can cause problems. We've had cases of wrong taillights causing the transmission not to shift. We had cases of wrong spark plugs causing transmission problems. So make sure you, you educate yourself and when you need a tune-up or something, ask for OEM, which is original equipment but from the manufacturer, that that brand be restored into your vehicle. That's the safest bet. So typically GM is uh, AC Delco, Ford is usually a Motorcraft, Foreign cars, a NGK is a common plug, uh, or Dens Densco. For bulbs and stuff, go to the manufacturer. You pay a little more, but you, you alleviate um, the risk of causing yourself a problem. Or, and if you do go aftermarket, and you install the product, be mindful if it ha something happened after you did that. You know, write down in a little book, change right rear headlight. Now, if your wife says, you know, since you changed that headlight, something's acting weird, you know where to go. Change that bulb again, go get the original bulb, see if it solves the problem. You know, a lot of these things you can do yourself without costing you money. Of course, changing headlights and stuff in some of these cars is bizarre. You got to take off the bumpers in some case. <clears throat> you know, we had an interesting case this week. We had a, you know, that's a stupid uh, a friend of mine's sister's car. 2013 Buick LaCrosse had an ABS code. Now, ABS is, is a, um, part of the traction control system. It shut down the power steering. Now why would a engineer, because of an ABS code, want to shut down the power steering and the car's hard to steer? To me that seems like a safety issue. You could still steer the car, but it was like without power steering. All because of a, a right rear a speed sensor on the wheel. The sensor was good. The bearing has a magnetic pickup. And it just fell apart and broke, so there's a segment missing. And that caused the code, which disabled the power steering. You believe it? That seems like a stupid move to me, to disable power steering for an ABS sensor. Anyway, I hope that helps. I'm arriving at work. 
a few seconds. Usually a bunch of deer cross the road here are turkeys. Sometimes I catch them in the morning eating in the field. There's a nice big buck floating around here. Anyway, I'll catch you on the next one. Thank you.